Welcome to the presentation on periodic properties. This is part one of a three-part presentation on this topic for the AP Chemistry class at Don Bosco Technical Institute. Before we get started, you will need a few things. You'll need a periodic table and a pen and paper. Also, I recommend that you print out these slides. Uh, there should be either a link in the video description below or it will be sent to you by email or both. Total time required to view all three of these videos will be about two hours. This will depend on your uh, your facility with the topic. The There are several practice slides which require you to pause the video and uh, try to work out problems on your own. How much sp time you spend on these will determine the total amount of time you uh, you need to spend on this entire project. Okay, so the periodic table is an incredibly useful tool in chemistry, as you already know. But so far, you've been using the periodic table to look up information. In other words, things like atomic weights or atomic numbers, things like that. Before we go any further, you need to remember a bit of vocabulary. Please remember that a period is a row on the periodic table. In other words, moving horizontally means you're moving within the same period. A group or a family is the same thing as a column on the periodic table. So if you move up or down, you are looking at elements within the same group or elements within the same family. Now what we're going to get, out in, uh, get at in this presentation is that both the physical properties and the chemical properties follow some very reliable trends across a period and down a family. A simple example of this is that within a group, chemical reactivity is similar. So if you look at the first group elements, those are hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium, all of these elements form ions with a plus one charge. And that's just one of the really simple periodic properties, but we'll get into much more complicated ones. Not only do you have to know these periodic trends themselves and have to know how to use them to solve problems, but you also have to know the underlying causes of these periodic trends. And you can trace all of the periodic trends back to two fundamental causes. Those are the number of protons and electrons in an atom and the electron configuration of that atom. Now, the number of protons and electrons determines a quantity called the effective nuclear charge. And the electron configuration, as well as the effective nuclear charge, affects what's called the atomic radius and a somewhat less important topic called the ionic radius. Once you understand effective nuclear charge and atomic radius, these two factors can be used to determine the attraction of the nucleus to electrons. In other words, how tightly those electrons are bound to an atom. Based on that, you can make predictions of all sorts of periodic pro uh, properties, such as ionization energies, electron affinities, and the activity or nobility nobility is the opposite of activity, um, or reactivity is another term, of an element. In other words, how likely is an element to participate in a chemical reaction? In part one of this presentation, we're going to be focusing on the top three rows of this diagram. So let's get started. Let's talk about attraction and how that affects reactivity. So redox reactions, those are reduction oxidation reactions, involve an exchange of electrons. One element gains electrons, the other element loses electrons. If electrons are strongly attracted to the nucleus, then the atom is unlikely to give up electrons. But in other words, it is unlikely to oxidize. So that should make sense. If the electrons are strongly bound to the nucleus, that means it's going to take a lot of energy to pull the electrons off. That means that you're unlikely to lose electrons and hence unlikely to oxidize. The reverse of this logic is also true, that atoms will strongly attract electrons from other atoms. Well, it's not exactly the reverse of the logic, but anyway, um, atoms that have a strong attraction 
uh, between the electrons and the nucleus are very likely to reduce. In other words, they're very likely to rip electrons off of a nearby atom. Now, uh, if electrons are weakly attracted to the nucleus, then that means they are likely to give up electrons. In other words, they are, they are likely to oxidize. And the atoms will not, uh, the atoms like this will not attract electrons from other atoms. In other words, they are unlikely to reduce. They're unlikely to grab an electron from a neighboring atom and incorporate it into itself to make an ion. All right, so this attraction thing seems to be really important. Let's look at some of the causes uh, or the three fundamental causes of attraction between the electron and the nucleus. There's the attraction of the electrons to the protons. There is also repulsion of electrons to other electrons. Electrons both have a negative charge. Put two negative charges together, they repel each other. And these two quantities can be combined into a single concept called effective nuclear charge. We'll get to that a little, a little later in the presentation, but just remember that effective nuclear charge takes into account two factors, that is the attraction of electrons to the protons and the repulsion from each other. Now, there's a third factor, which is the distance between the electrons and the protons. Electrostatic attraction, in other words, attraction of positive to negative charges, depends on the distance between those charges. The longer the distance, the lower the attraction. Think of two magnets. You move the two magnets farther apart, they're less attracted to each other. And we talk about uh, the distance in terms of atomic, or somewhat less likely, ionic radius. And that should make sense. If you have a higher radius atom, then that means that that uh, the distance from the nucleus to the outermost electrons is higher. Okay, so let's take a look at this concept of effective nuclear charge. And we're going to start with an example. The elect let's look at the electron configuration of aluminum. Aluminum starts with a neon core, and it has three valence, uh, three electrons on top of that. These are called valence electrons. Three in the, sorry, two electrons in the 3s shell, and one electron in the 3p shell. So we got these 13 protons in the middle. Uh, remember, the number of protons is the same thing as the as the atomic number. So the atomic number, often abbreviated Z. The atomic number for aluminum is 13. The 10 electrons from the noble gas core, in other words, the neon core in this case, are called shielding electrons. And so in this case, S equals 10. And then the electrons in the outermost level, these are called the valence electrons, uh, are the ones that are not part of the noble gas core. And so there are three electrons that are not part of the noble gas core. That means three valence electrons. Now, remember that only the valence electrons react because they are the farthest one from the nucleus. If you're going to rip an, an electron off, that means that it's going to, you're going to lose it out of the valence electrons. If you're going to add a new electron in, that means you're going to add it to the valence shell. Now, let's again look at the attractive versus repulsive forces in an aluminum atom. And specifically, we're going to look at how much charge acts on the valence electrons in aluminum. So we have attraction between the negative 3 charge of the valence electrons and the positive 13 charge of the protons in the nucleus. We will have repulsion between this negative 3 charge of the valence electrons and the negative 10 charge of the shielding electrons. And just to, just to let you know, something that applies to this entire presentation is that the valence electrons have hardly any effect on each other. It's going to be a little bit of effect, but if we go from, say, three valence electrons to five valence electrons, that's pretty much not going to change anything. Okay, so how do we reconcile the attraction between the valence and the nucleus versus the repulsion between the valence and the shielding electrons. Well, 
that's where effective nuclear charge comes in. Effective nuclear charge is abbreviated ZEFF, so the nuclear charge is the same thing as the, um, as the atomic number, but the effective nuclear charge, we use the abbreviation for atomic number uh, and put this EFF subscript here. Okay, so effective nuclear charge is the number of protons minus the number of shielding electrons. So for aluminum, we have 13 protons, we subtract the 10 shielding electrons, and that gives us an effective nuclear charge of 3. And so this is commonly described as the amount of charge from the nucleus that is actually seen by or felt by the valence electrons. Everything else is shielded out. Okay, let's look at periodic trends in effective nuclear charge. Let's go uh, up and down the second period, uh, sorry, the second group or the second family. The, those are the alkali earth metals, beryllium, calcium, magnesium, strontium, and barium. Well, if you look at beryllium, it's got an atomic number of four, so we start with four, and then it's got a helium core. Helium core has two ele shielding electrons, so the four protons minus the two shielding electrons gives us a effective nuclear charge of two. Then we've got magnesium. Magnesium has a atomic number of 12. It has a neon core, so the neon core provides 10 electrons in the shielding uh, category, and so 12 minus 10 gives us 2. Calcium, calcium has 20 protons. The argon core gives calcium 18 shielding electrons, so again, not surprisingly, we have an effective nuclear charge of 2. And so we can draw the broader conclusion, you can do this with any uh, column in the periodic table, any group, that within a family or group, the effective nuclear charge is constant. Now one thing to notice is that the D and F electrons, those count as shielding electrons because they're actually farther in, they are closer into the nucleus, and generally speaking, they don't participate in chemical reactions too much especially with the chemicals we deal with in AP chemistry. So pause the video now and work out the effective nuclear charges for strontium and barium. Make sure that they are also two. I'll give you three seconds to pause this and restart it. Okay, I hope you got a effective nuclear charge of two for strontium and barium. All right, let's go across the third period of the periodic table, that is sodium, magnesium, all the way over to argon. So if you look at sodium, sodium has an atomic number of 11. It has a neon core which provides 10 core electrons, so 11 minus 10 gives us 1. Magnesium has 12 protons. It has the same neon core, giving us 10 electrons, so 12 minus 10 gives us 2. Aluminum, 13 minus 10 gives us 3. Silicon, 14 minus 10 gives us 4. Phosphorus, 15 protons minus 10 shielding electrons gives us 5. Sulfur, 16 protons minus 10 shielding electrons gives us 6, and you can continue this trend for chlorine and argon with predictable results. By now you should have reached the conclusion that the effective nuclear charge increases as you move to the right within a period or row. And remember, effective nuclear charge means stronger attraction between the nucleus and the valence electrons, or stronger attraction of the valence electrons. Go ahead and pause the video now and work out the effective nuclear charge for chlorine and argon. Okay, hope you got, the, uh, got those effective nuclear charges as 7 and 8 respectively. 
All right, so I said the second major factor affecting periodic trends is atomic radius. Now, there's a few different ways to measure atomic radius. For the most part in this class, we're going to be talking about something called bonding atomic radius. Generally speaking, as you get higher effective nuclear charge, as I said in the previous slide, higher effective nuclear charge means stronger attraction. Stronger attraction means a smaller radius. All of those electrons that make up the atom get pulled inward by that stronger attraction. So, higher effective nuclear charges give you slightly lower atomic radii. And again, the logic there is higher effective nuclear charge pulls your uh, pl pulls on the valence electrons more, in fact it pulls on all the electrons more, and that m makes for a smaller radius. Combine this with the fact we just discovered that effective nuclear charge increases as you move to the right in a period. This means that atomic radius increases as you move to the left in a period. The trends for atomic radius and effective nuclear charge are in opposite directions. And that's because higher effective nuclear charge gives you a smaller atomic radius. You can do the same thing with the principal quantum number. Higher principal quantum numbers give you large increases in the atomic radius. Now, just in case you forgot your quantum mechanics, remember that in quantum mechanics we uh, express or we represent each suborbital with a notation like this, this 4s2. The 2 is how many electrons there are, the s is which suborbital they're in, and the 4 is sometimes called the energy level or the principal quantum number. So the 4s2 orbital, or sub, the 4s2 suborbital, is bigger than the 3s2 suborbital. So higher principal quantum number gives you bigger spaces. Bigger spaces means bigger atoms. Principal quantum numbers increase as you move down a group, that is, up uh, downwards within a column. And the atomic radius increases as you move down a group as a result of that. So, to summarize things for those of you who are a little more visual learners here, as you move to the right on the periodic table, you get increasing effective nuclear charge. The trend for atomic radius is in the opposite direction. So you get increasing atomic radius as you move to the left on the periodic table. These are small increases in atomic radius. You also get increases in the principal quantum number as you move down a, a group. And it, atomic radius follows the same trend as principal quantum number, so increasing atomic radius, you get large increases in atomic radius as you move down a group. The trend for, the, these trends, as you can tell, will collide in the corners in order to give you the uh, cesium, which is the atom with the largest atomic radius, and helium, which is the atom with the smallest atomic radius. Okay, here are some practice problems on the principles you just learned. What is the effective nuclear charge of selenium? What has the higher atomic radius and why? Sodium or magnesium? Carbon or germanium? Finally, rank nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur in order of atomic radius. Please pause the video now to work these problems out on your own. In five seconds, I'll resume the video and we'll go over solutions. Okay, I hope you worked out these problems on your own. Let's go over the answers. What is the effective nuclear charge of selenium? All right, in order to, to, to do this, you need to remember two facts. Fact number one is that the formula for Effective nuclear charge is protons minus shielding electrons. The second fact is that D and F shell electrons count as shielding electrons. So, selenium has an atomic number of 34, so Z is 34 for selenium. 
and then the electron configuration of selenium includes a argon noble gas core that gives you 18 electrons plus a complete D shell that gives you another 10 electrons. So working out the math here, 34 minus 18 plus 10 gives you 6. In terms of higher atomic radii, both sodium and magnesium have valence electrons in the 3s shell, but sodium has a lower effective nuclear charge. That is the key difference, lower effective nuclear charge. The lower effective nuclear charge means that the valence electrons are less attracted to the nucleus, making the atomic radius of sodium larger than magnesium. Now, notice how I answered in this, and this is how the College Board expects you to frame your response, uh, to, to phrase your responses on an AP exam. You have to do two things when you're comparing. You have to say what they have in common, in this case, the electrons in the 3S shell, and then you have to state the difference, and then you have to state how that difference correlates or, or causes the, the differences in the property you're looking for. So I guess I should have said that you have to state the fundamental similarities and differences, get it going all the way back to electron configurations and effective nuclear charge. Start there and then work forward with the logic. Anything based purely on periodic trends gets zero points for the explanation. You might get a point for choosing sodium versus magnesium, but you will not get any point for the points for the uh, explanation if you don't go all the way back to effective nuclear charge and electron configurations. Okay, with that, let's apply the same basic logic to carbon and germanium. In terms of electron configuration and effective nuclear charge, what's the same, what's different, how does that cause differences in, in the property we're looking for, namely atomic radius. Both carbon and germanium have an effective nuclear charge of 4, but germanium has its valence electrons in the 4p shell, whereas carbon has its valence electrons in the 2p shell. The higher principal quantum number indicates that the electron shells are bigger, making the atomic radius of germanium higher than carbon. Again, so the basic framework for these answers is what they have in common, what the difference is, how that difference affects the property we're interested in, and finally, don't forget to answer the question, which one is bigger? Germanium is bigger than carbon. Okay. Last but not least, rank nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur in order of atomic radius. You really need to look at a periodic table in order to understand this. So let's look at a chunk of the periodic table. Also, remember the periodic trends for atomic radius. You get small increases as you move to the left and big increases as you move down. So it shouldn't be surprising that, the, uh, that phosphorus is the biggest and that oxygen is the smallest because those are both the extreme ends of these trends. Now, the big question is, between nitrogen and sulfur, which one is bigger? You know that nitrogen and sulfur should be between oxygen and phosphorus because in order to go from oxygen to phosphorus, you have to pass the, these two guys one way or another. So if we go from oxygen to nitrogen, we get a small increase. If we go from oxygen to sulfur, we have a big increase. That means that the atomic radius of nitrogen should be just slightly small, larger than the atomic radius for oxygen, and the atomic radius for sulfur should be significantly larger. And that big change makes sulfur bigger than the small change, namely nitrogen. So that's how we get this ordering. Okay, this concludes the first part of the AP Chemistry presentation on periodic trends.